central lobular is because you will magnify it, you will go right up to the fissure and you will see that none of the, in these nodules actually touch the fissure. When you go right up to the pleural surface, you will see that none of these ground glass nodules ever touch the pleural surface, ever touch the mediastinal surface. So you know this is sitting in a space that is incapable of touching the pleura. So that's only the central lobular space. And they are more commonly ground glass and fluffy uh, sub-centimeter, but they can on occasion be more dense. The only difference in acute and subacute when the abnormality is central lobular nodules is the time from onset or the time from the insult. And over time, this will be an arbitrary uh, differentiation. So subacute, when it con the acute phase continues, when the, um, uh, the, the, the very thing that is giving them hypersensitivity pneumonitis continues to be in that patient's life, they go on to develop more subacute HP. What happens is if somebody has a very severe acute HP, they come into hospital, and this is seen pretty commonly, is they come into hospital, inevitably that thing that was giving them HP was left behind at home or at workplace. Because they happened to be in the hospital, they got well, and the doctors thought they got well because they were given antibiotics. So that starts the cycle of being undiagnosed. Then they go back home and they become unwell again. They come in again, again in the acute phase. Because they're in the hospital, they're away from that pet or that chemical, and they get better. Uh, and they get uh, labeled wrongly as a resolved infection, recurrent infection. It's only when the acute phase was um, mild enough for the patient to be at home do they go on to be develop the subacute phase. Or more commonly, when the patient is a healthy young person or a healthy um, adult, they uh, cope with the symptoms and they have this smoldering HP that becomes subacute HP. Subacute HP is the most common presentation out of all three phases of HP. Um, it is indistinguishable from the acute phase purely based on imaging. It is based, the diagnosis will be based on the onset of symptoms and the history. The acute and the subacute and the chronic, they lie on a continuum and depending on the time, uh, it is called a subacute. And even in the subacute phases, you can see early fibrotic changes or early distortion. And then if untreated or un by untreated, I mean they don't get rid of the, the, the substance or the, the pet or whatever is giving them HP, they go on to develop fibrotic changes. Sometimes, very rarely, they can even get rid of that um, antigen and still go on to develop fibrotic changes. This is um, technically not supposed to happen. And some people say that this happens is because you actually labeled them wrong. You didn't never actually found out what was giving them HP. So they could have HP because of multiple things. So technically, if they, they get rid of the, um, the, the chemical or the pet, they shouldn't go on to develop fibrosis. If they do, we do see it happen. And the theory is this happens is because there was still something else in their home or their workspace that was um, giving that irritation or that information to the air spaces or the lungs. Um, subacute is usually bilateral, bilateral, symmetrical, both lobes, all lobes, no clear zonal predominant. If it is slightly milder, you can see that it, it tries to favor the upper and the mid zones. Anything that we inhale and it irritates our air spaces tends to go in the upper to mid zones. If it's um, uh, if we inhale something that is heavy, and asbestosis being one of the very common things, then they settle into the bases of the lower lobes of the lungs, and those changes happen in the lower lobes. So if somebody says, why is asbestosis in the bases, whereas other inhalational or occupational lung diseases are in the upper and mid zones, is because of the, the substance they inhale, the weight and the size of it. So HP is usually. Uh, caused by substances that are very small, uh, airborne or inhalational, um, so fumes or pet hair or something like that, and they usually tend to um, favor the upper and mid zones. When they do develop fibrosis, the fibrosis is also very clearly mid zone predominant. It actually likes the mid zone <clears throat> more than the uh, upper lobe and the apices. It can track into the bases, but being pre a purely basal fibrosis makes it very unlikely to be HP. I'm just going to pause for a second, have a drink of water. <clears throat> 
so this one, when you can see that this patient does have ground glass or central lobular nodules, but you can also see that they started to get that architectural distortion. The bronchi have started to dilate. They turn this squiggly, irregular beaded appearance. So that means that the lung around it is getting a bit fibrosed, a bit distorted, a bit abnormal. Technically, at this phase, this could still be reversible if they if they heal completely. That could go back to a normal diameter of the bronchus, or this can be the first signs of the patient developing chronic HP. So this is worth mentioning on the scan that there there is clear evidence that this is still a subacute disease. Because why is that? Because you see subacute uh, HP, you want to see sub uh, crown glass central lobular nodule. The presence of central lobular nodules implies active disease and by active i mean acute and subacute so because somebody can have chronic hp and that doesn't mean that patient needs treatment especially if they're asymptomatic or the imaging has been stable for the last five years so they don't really need treatment they shouldn't it might be an incidental finding on a scan but when you see that central lobular nodularity you need, you know that this is active disease that's question. That's a question you will frequently get asked by the respiratory physician when you report that scan. They will make, might pick up the phone and call you and say, "Actually, I was wondering, does the patient have active disease?" And what they mean, or what they're implying, is is there central lobular nodularity? A chronic HP being the last phase or the last bit in the continuum or the end stage of the HP being chronic means fibrosis. Fibrosis, by definition, implies irreversible. But you can have fibrotic features in subacute that may be reversible. Chronic HP favors the upper and mid zones. That favor, um, favoring means that the reticulation or the architectural distortion favors mid zones. But the, the main sign that you want to see in HP is air trapping. And that air trapping is usually more clearly seen at the lung bases. So the lung bases can be abnormal in the sense that they show very clearly mosaic attenuation. And if you do an expiratory scan, it becomes more prominent. So you know it's air trapping. That can be more prominent at the basis, but the fibrosis itself has to be uh, more prominent in the mid zones. Uh, honeycombing, you can also see. Honeycombing is a sign I'll come to later. Uh, it's also seen, um, it can be seen in HP. So it doesn't mean that if, if everything else looks like HP, but you have honeycombing. You think to yourself, no, and now I can't possibly call it as HP. That's not true. You can see honeycombing in end stage HP as well. Um, this is what I meant by the air trapping. So air trapping is usually more prominent at the lung bases, and that's usually because of the breadth of inspiration or the amount of lung parenchyma you can see is more at the lung bases. For example, you see this uh, different texture, different attenuation of the lungs next to each other. That same patient on the expiratory scan, you can see that this is worsened. So the dark part has gotten significantly darker. The lung around it has gotten uh, significantly whiter. So that is clearly air trapping. Air trapping in a very small area of the lung, you can find in any, any expiratory scan if you look hard enough. What you mean by air trapping in the context of diagnosing somebody with HP is you want to see that air trapping bilaterally, at least one area in all the lobes of the lung to confidently say that this is actually air trapping. The question you most commonly think to yourself or somebody will ask you is, isn't it possible that the air trapping was airways disease, as in the patient has asthma and they still have a bit of ILD for some other cause and they both happen on the same time in the same patient? And the answer is yes, that happens quite commonly. So that's where the distribution of fibrosis will come into play. That's where the history will come into play. That you have to put it all together and come up with a reasonable differential. But yes, you can have air trapping because of underlying mild airways disease, asthma, and the patient has ILD. So you can have both at the same time. This is what I mean by the distribution of fibrosis. So the traction is a sign of fibrosis, meaning there's some something around it that is pulling that bronchus. So when I mean fibrosis, I mean traction. So the traction and the distortion in HP will be predominantly in the mid zones, predominantly upper and mid zones. So that's what you see in these slices. So a mid zone, upper, upper lobe, um, architectural distortion, traction. In the context of the bilaterally, um, the lungs look mosaic. It looks like there's air trapping. So that looks pretty good to call somebody as chronic HP. And the reason I'm calling it as chronic is because I don't see any nodules. I don't see ground glass, central lobular nodularity. So I know this is only chronic. 
you can have subacute on chronic so the patient had chronic hp um, they went on and got something else a new pet a new occupation that gave them hp or something else or the same uh, exposure to the same unknown antigen they had last time and they can have the same thing over and over again and that's quite common to see subacute and chronic hp before we come on to um, idiopathic or the ips i'll pause for a second and see if you guys have any questions so far about hp so 30 seconds can asthma patients develop hp they can can hp patients develop asthma they can will you be able to tell them apart on the scan no on imaging alone any difference between acute versus subacute if it's uh, if this the patient is well enough to be ambulatory as in the patient is in on the itu or isn't really and really unwell and no there is no way of differentiating acute versus subacute the only way you can differentiate acute versus subacute is when the patient had consolidation as well so they were so advanced or so severe a disease they had nodular nodularity as well as consolidation so you don't really get consolidation in subacute when you see consolidation you you tend to call it acute hp but that is a very rare um, presentation is expiratory phase needed to diagnose a trapping absolutely if you're going to label somebody as chronic hp uh and uh, expiratory scan uh, is absolutely necessary so this sometimes that happens at the time of initial it depends on the, your protocol so if the patient was being worked up for ild and they had a scan requested as specifically for hrct the initial um broad assessment for underlying ild will include an inspiratory spiral it will include an um interspaced expiratory some countries for uh, for example the american guidelines even recommend a spiral expiratory we in the uk don't do that uh, you uh, or and you can have even have prone so that's your initial assessment for ild sometimes you can have a suspicion of um, hp come up from some other source so if the patient had a staging scan for some other reason and the patient ended up with the ild mdt saying is this hp so the patient never had an expiratory scan so the first step would be to um, uh get a small limited study a limited interspaced expiratory scan and when you can definitively call that as air trapping on the background of lungs that look like hp you are pretty sure that that patient has chronic hp effect of smoking on hp effect of smoking on anything isn't good and hp isn't any different uh the one rule of thumb it was used to be true was the patient if patient has we were told i'm sure all of you were that if the patient has asthma they can't smoke which isn't really true because nowadays when you have vaping and all these um so by smoking you mean tobacco and then there's vaping then there's uh, marijuana smoking then there's all sorts of um substances that are mixed in marijuana to smoke so smoking in itself can give someone hp especially if that smoking is not tobacco or if that smoking is um vaping so there's an entity that's quite interesting if you guys google it is called vaping vape lung so vaping related lung injury is quite uh, significant when it presents as very severe we've had three or four in the last one year and they look very bad so uh, vaping is it is it's kind of um hp as well isn't it so yeah smoking isn't good for anyone smoking alone depending on what you smoke can give you hp as well can ild be unilateral it can be ild can have all sorts of weird presentations and it it can be asymmetrical quite commonly it can very rarely be um unilateral as well and then the question comes in is that ild primary ild or that was did that patient just have an infection on that side of the lung or that patient had a hemorrhage on that side of the lung that they ended up with a scarred lung that looked like ild so that's a discussion what's happening but um but that technically yes they can so moving on to idiopathic pneumonias interstitial pneumonias so the term that is used very interchangeably is uip and ipf and that is 
something I would really hope you guys get um, very clear in your mind um, by the end of today's session is that IPF does not mean UIP and UIP does not mean IPF. IPF is a um, diagnosis, it is a disease. UIP is not a disease, it is a description of a pattern. So saying UIP doesn't mean anything. The IPs are just terms to describe imaging, they are not diseases. So interstitial pneumonias and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are two different things. They are used interchangeably and a lot of people who um, are not clear on the concept use the word interchangeably. So when you call somebody as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you're giving them a death sentence. There is no cure for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There are uh, antifibrotic drugs. Those are very expensive depending on which healthcare system you work in. They are hard to get your hands on depending on where you are in the world. And the end stage uh, treatment for any IPF is lung transplant. So pulmonary fibrosis is a very serious diagnosis. It is an irreversible disease. That is a death sentence. So IPF is a disease that is a diagnosis of exclusion. Once you have excluded every other reason the patient can have bad lungs, you are left with a diagnosis of exclusion. So there is no test that will tell you that you have IPF. There is no symptom that will tell you you have IPF definitively. Lung biopsy can, but that is not a route we want to take commonly because somebody with diseased lungs is also at a higher risk for complication from lung biopsy. So it's, it's, a, um, it's reserved for very specific questions. So um, just to repeat, IPF and UIP doesn't mean the same thing. The IP is the UIP, the, the LIP, the DIP, the NSIP, all the IPs are descriptive terms of what you see on imaging. Those patterns can be seen in many diseases and that pattern when you describe it implies a certain differential diagnosis. It doesn't mean a specific disease. So um, that's the point that I hope should be really clear in your mind. The diagnostic process in somebody who has suspected ILD or diffuse pulmonary lung disease is you want to know whether that patient is has IPF. That's the end point of any ILD discussion. When the patient has a scan and that scan is abnormal, the radiologist will describe the scan, come up with a, um, a pattern that they think fits that scan appearance and that pattern will then open up a few differential diagnoses. For example, if I say this patient has uh, this, this patient has da 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 on the scan, and I think this is NSIP. So NSIP is not a disease. The respiratory physician and I will discuss the scan in ILD MDT. They will say, "Are you are you fairly confident that did you think NSIP is the best fit?" And I will say yes. Then we look at a few abnormalities or the few diseases that can give an NSIP pattern of ILD. And those have specific tests that the physician will do based on what the patient is presented as. And, and that's how it, it will go, the diagnostic process. The, the scan alone will never give you a bond or clear diagnosis. Even if you have very clear traction, bungal dilatation, honeycombing, all the, the tick points, and you say def definite UIP pattern of lung diagnosis consistent with IPF. You shouldn't be saying that on a scan. You should be saying consistent with a UIP pattern of fibrotic lung disease. Why that patient had that pattern, you cannot possibly know. So don't give very serious diagnosis based on the imaging appearance. So focus on the, on the pattern and not the underlying cause. The pattern will guide you down a certain route and that route is hardly ever explored by the general radiologist. It comes out of a multidisciplinary team meeting. So the, the pattern differentiation, the pattern classification uh, is done by various societies. There are two uh, large main classifications that are followed in the world. There is the American or the ATS guidelines and there's the Fleshner Society guidelines. Depending on where you are in the world, you can follow either of them. There is a lot of overlap between them. The main difference between the American and the Fleshner is the, is the push for biopsy in the American one. Uh, the American guide and the difference, other difference being um, that the American guidelines actually endorse an expiratory scan that is spiral. That's a higher dose scan that yeah, the Fleshner Society does not. Whereas the other difference being that the biopsy trend. So the American guidelines will uh, suggest a biopsy on almost all the ILDs. Uh, 
whereas in the UK or where we follow the Fleshner guideline, uh, the biopsies are reserved for when you don't have clear answers on the scan. If you can make a fairly clear, fairly confident diagnosis of IPF based on the scan, we don't go down the biopsy route. So the UIP patterns, the definite UIP patterns and the probable UIP patterns don't really end up having biopsies because there are limitations, there are costs, there are waiting times and all that to consider. And this is unnecessary risk that should be avoided if it can be. Most places in the UK, um, we practice a hybrid sort of guideline. So some, in some classes, some aspects we follow the ATS and in some aspects we follow the professional guidelines. This is not meant to confuse you, but this is just meant um, to put things into perspective. The only thing that would be important for you at your stage is to uh, understand the, the main four um, categories that you want to put a scan into. So once you've made a diagnosis, there's definitely ILD. You want to then go down these four routes. Can I put it into any of these four boxes? And how you can put it into any of these four boxes is how is we'll go through that in, in the next uh, few minutes. The definite and probable UIP patterns are almost identical. There is only one difference between the two patterns, and that is honeycombing. We'll come to that in a bit. Um, but these four categories are present in ATS, and they're present in the Fleshner. So they're uh, fairly similar in that sense. Uh, definite UIP, probable UIP, both basal predominant, both subplural. The main thing to consider for these two, definite and probable, is that you don't see any other predominant abnormality other than reticulation. So too many lines in the lung is the main problem. There is, or there can be a bit of ground glass, but that ground glass change will always be considerably less than the degree of reticulation. So the main predominant abnormality is too many lines, reticulation, that happens to be peripheral, and it absolutely needs to be basal predominant. It can be anywhere in the lung, but it has to be worse at the base of the lungs. And by base, I mean lower half of the lung, not, not back, posterior part of the lungs. If there is any feature on the CT, in addition to this, that is inconsistent with UIP, that means if there's too much air trapping, there are too many consolidations, there is too many, uh, there is pneumothorax, there's too many cystic changes, there is, too, there is significant emphysema, uh, any of that feature, in addition to those features that we want to see in UIP, would prevent that scan to be put in these two boxes. And the distribution can be a bit abnormal, it can be heterogeneous, it can be asymmetrical, very rarely it can be uh, unilateral, very rarely, and I mean once in five years, rarely. Um, and the main difference between definite and probable UIP is presence or absence of honeycombing. You can have everything that looks like probable UIP, but there's still um, ground glass, but there's slightly more than you would want to see. So you want to call it probable UIP, but you're not really 100% um, sure there's some ground glass that makes you a bit uneasy. There's some features that you can't really put here or there. Anything that, that eventually will probably will end up being probable UIP, but today, right now on the scan, is indeterminate for UIP, gets called indeterminate for UIP. And why that is important is you don't want to label somebody as probable UIP because when, when you put down somebody that route, down that route, you close down other avenues. So keeping them in the indeterminate for UIP pattern box makes the referrer or the clinician think outside the box. So they will still look for other um, diagnoses that may be reversible. For example, like sarcoidosis or lymphoma or um, uh, scleroderma, SLE, connective tissue diseases, drug induced, anything that makes you slightly uneasy, um, you should err uh, towards indeterminate for UIP rather than push it down probable UIP. When there is clearly abnormalities on it that can think that make you think of alternative diagnosis. The alternative diagnosis will come to after this, for example, organizing pneumonia, for example, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, for example, dense calcified pleural plaques that make you think of asbestosis. For example, a patient that is known to have connective tissue disease, patient has RA, they have a dilated esophagus, they have joint erosions that you can see on the scan. So that's when you think of alternative diagnosis. So you will, you will describe the features and you will 
describe the additional features and put in some additional um, possible differential diagnosis rather than calling it UIP or probable UIP. So how would you approach a scan that shows um, abnormalities? So first you will see whether there is interstitial abnormality or whether there is interstitial lung disease. Lung disease means a disease process that needs a workup. Abnormality can be a, a transient change. It can be an insignificant change. It can be incidental finding, post-inflammatory focal area of change. So ILA and ILD are not the same thing. ILA gives you a bit more luxury in describing an abnormality and dismissing it. ILD triggers the whole cascade of refer to respiratory, refer to ILD, MDT, and all that. So once you are sure there is reticulation, significant enough for me not to be able to dismiss it, you then want to look for fibrosis. And how you look for fibrosis is you look for traction bronchial dilatation. Once you have convinced yourself that you can see areas of the lung where the bronchi are being pulled, there is traction, you know there is ILD, and you also know there is established fibrosis. Once you have those, then you need to look at the distribution. Is it basal? Is it subplural? Is it honeycombing? All three, check, UIP, check. Is there anything that is in addition to these findings that make me think of alternative diagnosis? Is the plura okay? Are the lymph nodes okay? Uh, is the patient known to be a connective tissue disease patient? None of that, UIP, check. All of that present, but honeycombing absent, you need to uh, call it probable UIP. And if there is anything slightly uneasy about it, there's ground glass that is a bit too much. And there is slightly architectural distortion more in the upper zones. You can't really call it basal. Any of these, feel free to call it indeterminate for UIP. So I'll put this slide up and then ask you guys, do you think there is ILD? And if so, in which three of these do you think there is ILD? So 30 seconds starting now. Okay. Okay, let's go through what you guys have said. So Shima has said A has a fusion. Absolutely right. So she, uh, the patient in A has bilateral pleural fusions. Then they have this septal thickening at the lung basis. So what do you think that is? That would be fluid overload. So that wouldn't be ILD. B has consolidation. Absolutely right. Uh, and some of you have said Faisal, Sh um, Shima, Kanchan, AN and Donna, that none of them actually have ILD. And you guys are absolutely right. All of this is just septal thickening for another cause. This is smooth septal thickening, but the subplural lung looks very smooth and very normal. Um, septal thickening being more central. So this is septal thickening because of fluid overload, heart failure. This one is just consolidation and causing a bit of architectural distortion around it. So this is just linear atelectasis confusing you because the other lobe looks pretty okay. The subplural part of the lung looks okay. And this in the context of plural effusion um, should not be thought of as ILD. So none, none of these is actually ILD. Uh, traction bronchial dilatation. So traction bronchial dilatation, by definition, you want to see something around that bronchus pulling it, whether that is reticulation or whether that is ground glass. It will be reticulation pulling that bronchus in UIP patterns of fibrosis. It will be ground glass attenuation around that bronchus and that bronchus getting dilated. So you will then think, is this ground glass fine fibrosis or is this ground glass um, NSIP? So NSIP historically we, was used to be classified as um, cellular NSIP and fibrotic NSIP. 
but nowadays we just focus on calling it nsip rather than trying to focus too much on which type of nsip it is so i did i dilated bronchus the lung around it is completely normal it's primary bronchiectasis a dilated bronchus the lung around it is abnormal is traction bronchial dilatation if that abnormality is traction that is a uip pattern when that uh, area around it is ground glass you start thinking of nsip when that consolidation when there is clear consolidation around it you have to think whether that is reversible that is just normal infection finding um, and i'm sure all of you will appreciate that in c you have this consolidation and you can see bronchi through it so this is just air bronchogram this is not traction bronchial dilatation you see bronchi more clearly when they're in the middle um, of a white area like consolidation so they're more striking or more appreciable but it doesn't mean that they're dilated in b uh, the bronchi are the typical squiggly irregular worm like and the lung around it is very coarsely um, reticular so this coarse reticulation subplural predominantly um, with dilated bronchi reaching up to the pleural surface that structure and bronchial dilatation the first one is very subtle that's why i put it in uh, but you if you focus closely there is traction bronchial dilatation there is thin bronchus going all the way up uh, it is irregular it is non tapering and the lung around it is coarsely reticular so all three uh, all the first two is traction bronchial dilatation and the third is just common consolidation with a bit of air bronchograms the other thing to uh, to think about ild is not to overcall it uh, if the patient is a 92 year old with um, no other symptoms presented with the kct kub and you can see the base of the lungs the base of the lungs don't look perfect don't go ahead and call it ild there is something called age related change or age related ild with age our lungs get stiffer um, less elastic so they can look a bit abnormal on imaging it is forgivable up to a certain stage and beyond a certain age you have to think uh, pragmatically whether is there any benefit in overcalling or pushing this patient down a diagnostic route for very mild early changes or can i dismiss this as age related changes for example in this one if you look if if this was your first scan uh, and you saw this subpleural change and this patient happened to be a 95 year old um i would urge you to err on the side of undercalling it and just describing it and say maybe um attributed to patient age if this was a 60 year old and you had these lungs you shouldn't be calling it as age related change because that would then in in the context of age and especially symptoms make you think of is this early ild uh and the only test in reality is follow up so when you see these patients followed up if they actually had no symptom at that point it would be not unreasonable to recommend a one year follow up so if they came back in one year and they ended up with a scan like that you know they clearly have ild and it is progressing at this if this was the initial scan you would be way more confident calling this ild but on the first one uh, depending on the age the patient presentation um that your report would be tailored according to that but if you do look closely you do see a bit of traction that there as well this is a very medial part of the lung especially near the lung bases is where we have uh, degenerative changes in the spine so you can have dense prominent osteophytes sitting there so you can have focal fibrosis next to uh, degenerative changes of the spine and that's not ild that is just the lung reacting to a foreign body so the osteophyte is pressing into the lung and the lung around it kind of reacts to it so that's not ild you can describe it if it's very prominent but you can say that focal fibrosis related to degenerative changes of the spine does not need any further work up because that will almost certainly be asymptomatic the other thing ild can uh, mimic as is dependent change so if you look especially in the acute in patient setting unwell patient a heavy patient patient who's been lying in bed for a long time because they're unwell for some other cause if you do, if you ct them it's not it's very common to see dependent change so dependent change by definition should be dependent and with time and the number of scans you report and the number of uh, years of experience you have you get pretty confident calling it is dependent change and most of the time we don't even notice it anymore when that dependent change shows up on a scan that was done to look for ild then you look a bit more closely then you start noticing everything more closely then you start confusing yourself so if that was your uh, scan for ild um, uh, investigation and you saw this change if you can see and convince yourself that this change is only in the dependent parts of the lung whether that is uh, fine reticulation 
or whether that is um, subtle ground glass it will be dependent change when that change starts creeping up laterally around the lung in more interior areas is when you uh, should start getting uncomfortable by dismissing it and especially when you can see the bronchi getting dilated in it or around it you then start to think whether this is a bit more than i would dismiss it the first step would be to recommend a prone scan because on a prone scan they should improve or resolve and that would um, tell you whether this is a dependent change or rld but this certainly worth asking yourself that question when you see the changes if you see changes look for them anteriorly and laterally if you can't find anything to yourself is this all just dependent change am i over calling ild uh, so what is honeycombing honeycombing is a sign that um, is associated with end stage lung fibrosis it is end fibrosis the end of the air spaces architectural distortion progresses and progresses and then the normal tissue or through distortion ends up <clears throat> with end stage cyst formation uh, this cyst doesn't need to be stacking they don't need to be on top of each other even one cyst can be honeycombing but your confidence in being able to diagnose it as honeycombing should be very low um, when it's just one cyst you see so that's why we ideally recommend that when you see a cyst sitting right up to the pleural surface can you convince yourself this is just a cyst or are you i'm sure this isn't a bronchus that is um seen out of pain so the lower half of the bronchus is in another slice and you can see the top end or the end of the bronchus sitting on the pleural surface and it looks like a cyst but that's an end on bronchus when you see them stacking up to each other two three then you can be sure this this can't be a bronchus and that's why traditionally we want to see two or three cysts stacking up before we call it honeycombing the honeycombing doesn't need to be on the lateral part of the lung um it can be paramediastinal it can be for, next to the fissural uh, pleura it can also be right in the middle of the lung because it will look like in the middle of the lung but it's actually the base of the lung uh, so on the basal slices you can see honeycombing right in the middle but if you look at sagittal this is actually the the lower surface of the subpleural surface honeycombing means end stage fibrotic lung disease it does not mean ipf it means definite uip you can have definite uip pattern <clears throat> with uh, ipf and many other diseases as well not it's, it's not really helpful but it's certainly worth pointing out <clears throat> that you can see honeycombing in non uip pattern as well for example nsip and uh, hp can also show honeycombing but that should be certainly not be the predominant factor so Uh, I'll pause here and make sure you guys understand so far. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Give you twenty thirty seconds. what is bronchiolectasis bronchiolectasis is that end airway dilating all the way up to the pleural surface and how can we bronchiolectasis versus bronchiectasis bronchiectasis is a primary abnormality of the bronchus bronchiolectasis is only seen when it's fibrotic lung disease because the end airway doesn't really have that much muscle in it that will have primary bronchiectasis so when the end airway dilates all the way it's it's almost always because of fibrosis um one small cyst with reticulation can be called uip absolutely not uh, no you want to be really confident and you want to err on the side of caution before you label somebody as definite uip uh if you have one cyst with reticulation that's not indeterminate for uip that's probable uip is it mandatory for honeycombing to be layers it is not it depends on your experience if you are a very experienced cardiothoracic radiologist even one layer of honeycombing Uh, you can call as honeycombing but my question to you with would be are you sure this is not paraseptal emphysema and this is honeycombing you don't really know do you so it's um, better to see it stacking up but there is not a technical requirement for it to stack up um one if you ask me in the question higher up can we use emphysematous cyst or just cyst you cannot use emphysematous cyst because 
emphysema means destruction of the lung cysts mean a space occupying lesion that is a cyst a cyst can be a tumor a cyst can be a bronchocele a cyst can be a pneumatocele a cyst can be um congenital uh, so yeah don't call it emphysematous cyst call emphysema emphysema and cyst cyst and i hope you would attempt to differentiate between the two like i said before cysts have wall emphysemas do not um if there is a thin wall parenchyma cyst how to differentiate between emphysema versus pneumatocele pneumatocele is usually caused with uh, an insult to the lung so either infection and most commonly trauma pneumatocele is seen uh, as a result of acute injury to the lung it is like a pop of the lung it happens with blunt trauma it can have happen with infection especially pcp and pneumonia um that's pneumatocele pneumatoceles can have a wall or they can look like they have a wall emphysema should not have a wall emphysema is not a lesion emphysema is just empty space where lung used to exist so how to differentiate emphysema is you want to look for that central dot sign you want to see a strand of tissue going through that cystic area you want to see a dot hanging in the middle of that that is a vessel that used to feed that part of the lung you want to see a strand of septa that will likely be uh, containing that vessel in it so that's how you differentiate emphysema from cyst emphysema do not have walls and they have usually have something hanging in the middle uh this is how typically you would be very happy calling it as honeycombing you can see stacks and stacks of uh, cysts and you can see a dilated bronchus going into it if you saw that you would be very uh, comfortable calling that as honeycombing the the problem happens when they're not so obvious so for somebody who have asked before what is bronchiectasis this is bronchiectasis so this is that bronchus this bronchus you can see going and then disappearing this is a cyst sitting next up to the pleural surface and this cyst is likely another bronchus that is seen on another slice either above or beyond it so that's bronchiectasis and because this is one cyst you are you shouldn't be happy uh, calling this honeycombing when you see these this is cyst on cyst so 1 2 3 4 cysts this on uh, on um, a is definite honeycomb uh, definite uip and b is probable uip other than the honeycombing bit there isn't any difference between them in terms of distribution or um other um, morphological features uh, nsip is the second most popular ip um nsip by default is assumed to be caused or associated with another disorder so nsip is usually seen in connective tissue diseases or associated with some other diseases so the patient can have uh, in um, underlying connective tissue disease they can have an autoimmune disease they can have drug and use toxicity um something else going on with them so if if you have a scan and you labeled it as nsip that referrer will inevitably order 100 other tests to look for what is going on they will do all sorts of antibodies um uh, and ka sle uh, scleroderma ra all sorts of things they will look at the drug history they will look at the patient history um to look for other underlying disorders that are associated with nsip most commonly um, connective tissue disease so it's it's uh, a rare diagnosis much rarer than probable or definite uip and when you do uh, diagnose somebody with nsip they have to have other disorders excluded uh, and once they are excluded uh, and you're left with purely nsip it is rare but it can happen and what happens with nsip is it can evolve uh, a pa- and like i said before these interstitial um, pneumonias and hemorrhitis is just a pattern of ild somebody has nsip today doesn't mean next year they're not going to have uip so the pattern can evolve the only pattern that does not evolve is definite uip that's why the word definite in it when that is why the reluctance to not overcall it uh, if you have called somebody as definite uip the understanding is this pattern will never change the severity uh, can progress but they will always be definite uip nsip by definition probable uip by definition can evolve nsip can turn into probable uip probable uip one day can have superimposed viral pneumonia or infection or acute exacerbation they can look like nsip 
uh, or they can both progress into definite UIP. But once in definite UIP, they're not going to progress in any other way other than uh, progression of severity. This can give it a go. I would like you guys to define what the abnormality is and give it a pattern. Uh, 
then we'll go from there. 30 seconds starting now. Okay, let's look at the scan again and look at the predominant abnormality. The predominant abnormality on the scan is ground glass, not reticulation. So you can see ground glass on both sides. It is clearly more on the right side. The ground glass has a bit of texture to it. Um, so I think some of you may be confused by the texture and in calling that reticulation. <clears throat> but if you look at the periphery, um, those lines are actually just dilated bronchi and the predominant abnormality more centrally and anteriorly is ground glass. That ground glass is clearly causing traction because the bronchi are very significantly dilated within that ground glass compared to outside it. So bilateral abnormality, the predominant abnormality being ground glass. That ground glass is clearly causing traction bronchial dilatation. Why you know this is traction and not primary bronchiectasis is because outside that ground glass there is no dilatation. So uh, can this be an acute finding that is reversible? Yes. But if I told you this looked like this, um, a little uh, similar to this, but this has progressed over the last six months, um, then you would certainly think, is this ILD? Is this predominantly ground glass with traction? So the best fit would be NSIP. Uh, can this progress into probable UIP or change into probable UIP and ultimately end up with the probable UI, uh, definite UIP pattern? Of course it can. But right now, um, on this scan, this is an NSIP pattern of disease. The other pattern uh, you guys need to think about when you see bilateral abnormalities in multiple lobes is organizing pneumonia. So organizing pneumonia uh, can be an entity in itself when it is called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, or it can be organizing pneumonia uh, due to another cause. Organizing pneumonia is also a pattern of distribution of abnormality on the CT, it is not a disease. The disease is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and that means it is organizing pneumonia without any cause, and that is a di um, diagnosis of exclusion. Most uh, most recently, the disease we uh, all reported plenty of, unfortunately, was COVID, and organizing pneumonia was one of the patterns very clearly seen and associated with even COVID. So a lot of infections, a lot of drug reactions, a lot of um, Drugs, um, pharmaceutical drugs, recreational drugs uh, can look like organizing pneumonia. And that organizing pneumonia is not cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It is organizing pneumonia appearance of an infection or an inflammation. When you have no other cause for that organizing pneumonia, you end up excluding them. You end up with cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. This used to be called BOOP. Now it's called COP or organizing pneumonia. The, the feature you want to see um, to in a, especially in an exam scenario is you want to see fluctuating consolidation. So today they presented like this. Um, they would improve. Uh, they won't improve in antibiotics. They would improve with steroids. Uh, six months from now, they presented the same way, but this time the right, the areas we saw previously had gotten better. They had new areas in new locations. So fluctuating consolidation or fluctuating ground glass Bilateral can be any lobe, any distribution, um, distribution as in within the lungs, uh, top to bottom, can be organizing pneumonia. The pattern of organizing pneumonia is bronchocentric or subplural. And when you see it bilaterally and extensive, it becomes more easy to diagnose it. When you see it subtle, for example, here, uh, you might not think of organizing pneumonia. The thing about organizing pneumonia, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is an ILD. So when you have diagnosed or excluded um, other causes, 
and you're left with a scan that looks like this at the top, uh, you have no choice but to call it cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. If that patient, these patients respond very well to steroids, but they can't be on steroids forever. So they get um, uh, medium to long term steroids, then they are tapered off, they can recur or relapse. So it's, it's a constant struggle to find that balance. Some do really well, they will have another flare again. Um, that's not to say they're not going to have another flare in 10 years' time. Completely cryptogenic, nobody knows why it happens, but that's what it looks like. It looks like subplural consolidation, it looks like bronchocentric consolidation. It can be consolidation, or it can be ground glass, or it can be both. Um, this can resolve completely, or it can resolve with a bit of scarring. And by scarring, I mean a bit of architectural distortion in the areas that consolidation used to be. Or they can end up with a progressive fibro fibrotic ILD. So that scarring would keep progressing, keep pulling the lung around it, keep distorting the lung around it, and they will end up with chronic OP, a chronic organizing pneumonia, and that's a fibrotic lung disease with um, unfortunately has no cure. And that's the evolution of it. That's the acute presentation of it. You can have pleural effusions, but that's usually a reactive pleural effusion. It can confuse you a bit because you start thinking down the infection line when you see pleural effusion. But you see bilateral subpleural uh, bronchocentric consol uh, consolidation with air bronchograms that over time, weeks to months, will start uh, evolving into distortion. So you start seeing that irregular. Um, pulling of the bronchi, you see the irregular squiggly margins, that can be reversible. Uh, but weeks to months when that consolidation completely goes away and you're left with that um, distortion alone, that would be um, scarring. If that keeps evolving or the patient is symptomatic and it keeps progressing, that is fibrotic OP. Rarely you can see a purely bronchogenic pattern of OP, this is very rare. And is usually seen in drug-induced uh, or chemotherapy-induced diseases or opportunistic infections can sometimes mimic this, but it's purely bronchocentric. So the, along the bronchi, the inflammation sits. It looks very pretty on a scan. It's a very striking appearance. It's also very rare to see this appearance because when you, in real life, more commonly when you have this, you have subplural consolidation as well. So this is a very specific uh, pattern of OP, uh, rarer, but obviously becomes more easier to diagnose because you can't really call this infection or anything else, can you? So uh, DAD or DAD, depending on where you are in the world, is diffuse alveolar uh, damage. It just means that the lungs or type 2 pneumocytes uh, and the endothelial cells undergo necrosis. It's usually uh, driven by a cause. So the cause can be ARDS, the cause can be an ischemic insult, a pancreatitis even, or it could be idiopathic without a cause. So when it's idiopathic, diffuse severe um, inter pneumonitis that's called AIP or acute interstitial uh, pneumonia. Diffuse alveolar damage is a term used to describe severe bilateral abnormalities. You can't really tell whether this is interstitium or the lung space, the airways, or it's also severe. You can't really differentiate anything at all. It's, um, it can be described as diffuse alveolar damage. It is a term I would discourage you using. Um, and it's usually uh, reserved for ITU sort of patients when, when the changes are so advanced that you're it's like a spectrum of when you don't know whether this is ARDS or this is diffuse alveolar damage, whether there's a bit of hemorrhage in the middle, whether they had vasculitis or that caused, caused a cascade of events. It's a descriptive term. Um, it, can have, it has an acute exudative phase if the patient survives it. It's hard to survive it, but in modern medicine, the ventilator supports young patients, healthy, fit patients can recover from it. And if they do recover from it, sometimes the recovery can be very remarkable. Then the reparative phase starts. The repairing phase of it is actually more damaging to the lung because it's causing distortion and fibrosis and um, pulling and uh, almost permanent damage during that repair. So that repair will the kind of repair the lung goes through will determine what they will end up as an end stage deficit in terms of lung function. Um, so it's the most common presentation of diffuse alveolar damage is uh, drug induced. And by drug induced, I don't mean um, recreational drugs. I mean chemotherapy drugs. Immunotherapy drugs can cause that. Um, when you 
stop the drug, the patient improves. What happens is sometimes these chemotherapy drugs are used in connective tissue diseases, and can, patients with connective tissue diseases can have abnormal lungs, and the drugs they give them for those connective tissue diseases can give you that, those lungs. So it gets really hard to differentiate it. And usually it's, it's a, it's a um, mechanism of looking at when they started a drug and how, trying to hold the drug for a few weeks or months and see how the patient did. But it can be confusing. Uh, again, diffuse alveolar damage can look like diffuse ground glass, patchy, tending towards consolidation. It can be basal or it can be everywhere. Uh, just to point out that when you see diffuse ground glass and you see traction in the middle of it that looks so uniform, you can't really call that diffuse alveolar damage. So the word you should be thinking of if you saw that scan is NSIP because you don't really see distortion. You see uh, almost um, radiating dilated bronchi sitting in diffuse ground glass now. So this is actually fibrotic NSIP. Um, this pattern I put in there because this is a pattern of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and not diffuse alveolar damage. Um, both happen usually at the same time, but when it's purely hemorrhage, um, the patient obviously is coughing up uh, buckets of blood uh, and that pattern is um, very typical of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage rather than damage. Coming to CT ILD, I'll pause here because I know this is getting confusing. So I'll pause here and make sure you guys don't have any questions before I move on. 30 seconds for questions, please. So when I say bronchocentric, I mean uh, it's tracking along the bronchus and in the end airspace, so the, the bunch of grapes around it. So it's, uh, when you see a nodular focus of consolidation, you can see an airway coming into it, and that's bronchocentric. Or you can say peribronchial when it's going along linear to the bronchus, so interchangeable. Peribronchial when you want to say linear, when you say blobs of nodular consolidation, when you can see a bronchus going into it is bronchocentric. Can OP be diagnosed on the first scan or do we need follow-up scan? You can diagnose it on the first scan. When it's, when it's OP and it's clearly OP, it's very nice to look at. Um, and when you've seen it, you can, if you're confident, go ahead and call it. Like I said, it's a, it's, you're describing the lung appearance. You're not really calling it COP. You, I think your question is, can, you, can COP be diagnosed on the first scan? So the COP cannot be diagnosed on the first scan. Organizing pneumonia can be. Whether that organizing pneumonia is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or that organizing pneumonia is COVID or nitrofuritoin lung or chemotherapy-induced lung, you can't. How to differentiate fibrotic NSIP and DAD? So the fib DAD patient or the diffuse alveolar damage patient is very, very unwell. That patient is in the ITU. That patient is not sitting up and talking to you. NSIP patients are ambulatory patients um, walking around being worked up of ILD because something that develops slowly over months to years, the patients cope really well. And the patient over months has de reduced exercise tolerance. And they're not really that unwell looking. Uh, moving on to connective tissue ILD. So connective tissue or CTD ILD is a term reserved for interstitial abnormalities in patients that have known connective tissue diseases. The most connective tissue diseases you get asked about in the exam are these five. So SLE, RA, scleroderma, Jogren's, and there is a lot of overlap. The one that is slightly different from the other four is RA. RA is the only one that presents more commonly with UIP rather than NSIP. So when you call somebody as NSIP, they will get worked up for antibodies against scleroderma and SLE and all that whereas a uh, rheumatoid is more UIP tending. Uh, the NSIP pat pattern can be seen in all four of the, uh, all five of these actually, but when they are seen in scleroderma, SLE, they're almost, uh, you can't distinguish them apart. That's why the patients are worked up for all of them together. So all of the antibodies are done together, IgG and all that. 
and whatever lights up or whatever has uh, um, positive results, they go down that route. And obviously, then you have to examine the patient and look for the clinical symptoms. With scleroderma, you're going to look for the um, esophageal dilatation and the, you know the um, skin changes and all that. SLE is um, very heavily pleura-based. So SLE patients, when you think SLE, remember effusions, pericardial effusion, pleural effusions, pericardial thickening, pleural thickening. SLE is the one that goes towards the pleura. RA also gives pleural effusions, uh, sometimes pericardial effusions. Uh, these are the ones that you need to think of, especially for exam point of view, um, the connective tissue diseases that like the uh, membranes, so pericardial, pleural. Um, uh, they can be thickened, but very mildly, barely perceivable thickening on scan. They can be slightly enhancing, but fluid is what you're looking for. Scleroderma, yogurans, not so much. Uh, RA, I'll focus on more because RA is the one that is most confusing because the RA patients can have not only ILD, but they can also have airways diseases. So RA is um, special in the sense that sometimes the ILD comes before uh, joint manifestations of RA, so the patient not may not know they have RA, um, or the joint comes first and the ILD comes later, or the ILD never comes. What can uh, almost never happen is that they get the ILD but never the joint, um, and the ILD is almost never clean ILD. It's ILD as well as airways disease. The airway disease they get is bronchiolitis. So the bronchi, uh, the large airways, medium-sized airways have inflammation around them. So the airways can get thickened. So it looks like a bit like bronchiectasis, the thick bronchi, inflamed bronchi. And when you have inflamed airways, you get infection. So super added mild infection, atypical infection. The infection comes strain bud nodules. So fluffy looking nodules, dirty looking lungs, dilated bronchi, thickened bronchi is the airway problem of RA, so RA-related airways disease. Airway diseases is further divided into obstructive and non-obstructive. I'm not going to go into that um, today. The ILD can happen concurrently with the airways. Sometimes it can have only airways, but the ILD is usually ever, never just ILD. It has ILD and airways. Um, the ILD favors, and if you look at the pie chart, favors UIP more than other patterns. So the, it will start like probable UIP, um, by the end, it can be definite UIP pattern, um, and the patient has known RA, so they will label it. If even if you report it as um, a definite pattern, a definite UIP pattern of lung fibrosis, and the history says RA patient, the, the diagnosis the patient will get out of the MDT is CTD ILD. Uh, very rarely they can put, uh, um, present as diffuse alveolar damage. It's very rare, and the patients don't really uh, tend to do very well when that happens. Um, RA, ILD, like I said, when they are predominantly or only airway related problems with RA or RA related uh, bronchiolitis, you have these strain bud um, uh, nodules being the main problem, uh, thickened airways being the main problem. And when you have ILD predominant problems, you have the probable or the definite UIP in this coronal, um, coronal case when you have the honeycombing, or you can have a mixture of both, a bit of ground glass, bronchiectasis. Then you have ILD, so a bit of everything put in together. Um, I know it's, that's not really helpful in terms of you want a clear, you know, I will look for this, this, this to call it RA, ILD. But the point to remember about RA, ILD is the patient will present, um, may present as joint problems. They may present with airway problems. The scan may be messy looking. There will be a bit of airway issues, a bit of ILD issues. Um, so there's no easy answer, I'm afraid. Uh, I won't go into SLE and scleroderma because the thing to remember about them is they will present as an NSIP. And obviously, for exam purposes, you look for a dilated esophagus and all that. Um, moving on to drug-induced lung disease. Drug-induced includes uh, pharmaceutical drugs and it includes recreational drugs. Um, different drugs favor different patterns. There is a lot of overlap. Um, there are some exam favorites in terms of these drugs. Nobody expects anybody to remember all the drugs that cause different patterns. So nobody's going to ask you which drugs uh, give you a fibrotic pattern uh, of ILD, or which drug gives you isolated ground glass or abnormality on um, drug-induced lung disease. So it's a bit uh, unreasonable. And because there is so much overlap, what does happen is 
uh, the exam history or the patient history in real life you will say the patient is on this this drug um, and you will look at a scan that looks abnormal and with abnormal you will go through the different uh, the pattern is there ild is this an acute pattern is this uh, you will look for the pattern is this uip pattern is this op pattern is this a fibrosis as an nsip pattern is there just mosaic attenuation there's a bit of ground glass there's a bit of dark lung i can't really tell what's going on any of those uh, is worth describing and any of those could represent a drug induced lung disease the only way of definitively diagnosing drug induced lung disease is to stop the drug and follow up most of these recover with those sequelae the lung heals very well when the insult is external extrinsic um when you stop the drug the lungs come back comes back within months um to how it was and the symptoms um, recover much quicker than that imaging recovery is delayed uh organizing pneumonia is the number one uh, um presentation you see of drug induced lung disease is because it's so striking on a scan it's easy to differentiate from other for example low bar consolidation or um uip ipf the op pattern makes people think more down the drug induced line than any other pattern uh, nitrofurantoin unfortunately still very commonly oversubscribed by gps for prophylactic of utis it's um, it's seen and shouldn't be it's it comes in the exam as well um, and it gives an op pattern it can give a mosaic pattern the very specific exam related questions you will get is around certain drugs that are exam favorites uh chemotherapy drugs there are so many of them so don't bother learning around the names of the chemotherapy drugs or the immunotherapy drugs any of those you can google when you have a patient presenting with a certain abnormality and see whether that drug is actually nemotoxic there is a directory the national directory of drugs that are because it is mandated by drug agencies to um, put your drug on that list if that drug is known to cause or has caused in significant patients uh, nemotoxicity so that directory is free and accessible to everyone so you can look up a drug that you've never heard of before and the patient happens to be on it you can look it up whether that drug is actually nemotoxic um the common ones you will hear are rituximab nitrofurantoin um cyclophosphamide methotrexate methotrexate is very uh commonly seen because methotrexate happens to be a treatment for ra ra can give you ild and methotrexate can give you ild so you can have an ra patient on methotrexate and the question is does the patient have methotrexate induced lung injury and that's a really really hard question and the thing to look for then would be acute looking changes and by acute looking changes i mean diffuse ground glass more consolidation um a dirty looking abnormality that has come on within uh, weeks uh, or months even so the last scan was 3 months ago and the scan looked very different now they have new ground glass and the patient was put on methotrexate so the acute looking changes should make you think of drug induced rather than purely fibrosis um in terms of uh, the pattern itself unknown drug that's your presentation uh, that's that's bilateral architectural distortion ground glass tending towards consolidation can you think of any infection that would look like that can you think of ards that would look like that would pulmonary edema look like that you can't really fit into anything else and bizarre looking interesting looking patterns that are bilateral quite significant uh, involving all the lobes should make you think of drug induced um, lung disease methotrexate like i said before um seen quite commonly and it also recovers pretty well when you stop the drug so that's the patient's recovery over um, weeks to months and the patient improved with no sequelae cyclophosphamide a chemotoxic um, chemotherapy drug can give pneumonitis can give you ild can give you drug induced lung disease all these terms you can use interchangeably because you're describing an acute or subacute abnormality you can describe uh, the scan as there are bilateral changes with architectural distortion ground glass uh, area standing towards consolidation in the right lower lobe um that should make you think of either a typical infection so whether that patient has um, even maybe covid or any viral pneumonia that was really bad and the patient is immunocompromised they look like that or it should make you look uh, think of drug induced 
uh, pneumonitis the, over time they will the lung as it's getting put through that insult will constantly be trying to heal itself so it will start developing architectural distortion within days so you can have acute inflammation and you can have distortion on the same scan and over time the acute inflammation if the drug is stopped will go away and architectural distortion will take a bit longer to resolve and may never resolve completely immunodone um exam favorite because they want you to look at the liver uh, density and notice that it's a heart medication and that can give you ild uh, there's no specific pattern that you see of it for the lung the the feature that makes you clinch the diagnosis the the liver attenuation and believe it or not it's pretty uh, fairly commonly seen in real life as well cocaine is an in uh, is also nematoxic the abnormalities seen are seen in acutely unwell patient those patients have presented with a heart arrhythmia or cardiac arrest or itu setting and the lungs can look abnormal the problem that happens with cocaine lung is because the patient uh, lost consciousness and they had a cardiac arrest because they were you know on cocaine and that's how they came to the hospital if the question is while that patient was collapsed did he aspirate yeah he might have but is that um ground glass nemotoxic nemocyte inflammation because of cocaine either so this patient happened to be well and conscious no aspiration uh, and that was um, uh, called as cocaine lung but cocaine lung can look like uh, aspiration pneumonia it's predominantly ground glass it's predominantly airway centered Uh, it's usually bilateral there is no clear zonal distribution but it's an interesting scan to look at when you see it uh just at the end i will talk about a couple of uh, rare ilds just out of interest and because they happen to be exam favorites but i will pause here and see if you guys have any questions for me because we are ahead of schedule we're going to finish in 10 minutes or so if you have any questions uh, feel free to put them in the chat the thing i would say to shima is a lot of people find it confusing and it's completely reasonable to find it confusing uh, the one thing you can look at for organized pneumonia like i said before a lot of organized pneumonia patients do get di um, diagnosed incorrectly as bronco pneumonia they get if they're unwell to be enough to be admitted in the hospital they inevitably get put on antibiotics and then the patient doesn't improve and then somebody thinks of giving them a shot of steroids or a course of steroids and they do really well um and that's how it, the timeline happens uh, fairly commonly the organizing pneumonia if you see the distinct pattern of bronchocentric and clear subpleural uh, patches of consolidation bronco pneumonia shouldn't really give you that bronco pneumonia can have patches that are more central and the patches that are more peripheral there can be a bit of ground glass around it it is organizing pneumonia is more Uh, artistic looking is one way of explaining it um is hypersensitivity pneumonitis the same as external allergic alveolitis yes it's the same disease two different names is there any time gap to diagnose op rather than effective pneumonia no no you don't need you can have organizing pneumonia today and be diagnosed with it um there is no time frame you need to wait uh what is that entity with central dot sign with thick wall A central dot sign central dot of air with thick wall I don't really understand the question what is the entity with central dot of air with thick wall I don't understand the question sorry if you can explain it a bit better i may be able to answer that question from a complete new starter how do you tell the difference between atelectasis and reticulation Reticul reticulation are smaller smaller lines multiple lines sitting around the pleural space atelectasis is a band a thin band a long line 
that will cross multiple pulmonary lobules whereas reticulation is a small uh, very small line uh, different uh, and they should be multiple you can't have one little strand of reticulation it will be a diffuse abnormality multiple lines um, subpleural thin straight can you can ground glass haze be superimposed on honeycombing no and i would like you to be able to tell me why that is because honeycombing is dead lung it is non existent lung so if there is nothing there there is nothing to get infused with ground glass abnormality there is nothing to fill uh, if there is a cyst that is filled with anything it will be an emphysematous cyst or it will be a cavity in the lung that has got an infective and an air fluid level maybe that's what you mean but honeycombing shouldn't have anything imposed on it uh if mosaic perfusion where expiratory sh uh, scans shows air trapping can we give differential of pulmonary versus small airways disease if you have expiratory scan that shows you air trapping that gave you a definitive diagnosis of air trapping and airways disease you can then kick pulmonary vascular abnormalities out of the window and give only airways disease because vascular abnormality will not give you air trapping whereas airway abnormality will okay moving on the last bit is the unusual ilds these are the ilds you will see um more commonly in larger tertiary care centers and they you will see them in transplant centers you will see them in the exam setting very commonly uh, lam lch and there's a new entry new kid on the block called gl ild uh lam is lymphangiomyomatosis is actually a tumor that is a pro proliferation of the lam cells in the lung kidney and the lymphatics uh, people think it is only genetic but it is actually more sporadic than it is inherited uh, there are guidelines to diagnose somebody with lymphangiomyomatosis there are guidelines called from the japanese society and the american society from 2017 uh because if you see features of lam on ct you ideally want two other features from the ones listed below so you want to see the tuberculosis complex or you want to see uh, renal angiol myelopoma and the kylothorax um before you can label some with lam lam is a progressive disease it is a disease with no cure the only cure being a transplant it is not an indolent disease so when these patients um so you can't really call somebody lam and then expect them to do okay they will inevitably progress if they were actually lam and they will end up with end stage disease when all of the lung parenchyma will get replaced with cysts um and there will be nothing to irrigate the lung and the transplant will be the only thing left patients usually young females uh and non smokers uh, the abnormality is diffuse as in there is no zonal predominance uh, in terms of next to pleura away from pleura which lobe which position it can be anywhere in the lung they are cysts so as as an entity of a cyst they require to have a wall these walls can be thin enough that you can't see them for example if this was the scan you had um and you were doing busy on call with 80 scans during the night and this was a scan you would dismiss it in less than 5 seconds and call it emphysema and not look back and that is how these patients do get um, go undiagnosed only when it is so advanced and prominent and bilateral and the underlying lungs happen to be very healthy that you can see the cyst wall do they get picked up um and um when they have cysts the cysts are the only abnormality in the lung so lam patients don't have anything else it's a normal lung with cysts no reticulation no ild nothing uh, in otherwise a young healthy adult the when it's pretty advanced they can present with complications so the complication they will have is one of those cysts will pop they will have a pneumothorax or they can present with the kylothorax because those lam cells can also proliferate in the um, lymphatic channels in the chest so um they can present with recurrent kylothorax uh the other disease to think of is lch uh, langerhans cell histiocytosis um the understanding now and this has evolved over the last few years is the uh, lch is just a, within the spectrum of smoking related lung disease so smoking related lung disease can have anything 
um, from um, just emphysema to just a bit of central lobular upper zone nodules to both to diffuse bilateral ground glass so a DIP sort of pattern and over time they can have um, cysts so these cysts that these um, smokers develop are inflammatory cysts so uh, because of that they are ill-defined like almost starry uh, uh, speculate looking small cysts bilaterally and over time these cysts cavitate and turn into um, sorry these nodules cavitate and turn into cysts uh, to clinch the diagnosis of LCH, you want follow-up scans and you want to be able to find the cyst that on the previous scan was a nodule. So you can be sure that this is the nodule that cavitated and became a cyst. And if you, if you see multiple nodules turning into cyst, you are very confident in labeling it LCH. Uh, for exam point of view, they, uh, they will be in a smoker. The extreme lung bases will be preserved. Uh, they have thin wall cysts. They can be slightly thickened, but they can be um, because they're in a smoker's lung. It's a messy looking lung. It, they can look thickened. And they they are they can have a confluence of cysts, or they can be bizarre shapes. Um, but rarely do they exceed more than five to uh, ten millimeter. So this is what I mean by the ill-defined nodules. The nodules can look almost speculated, but because the speculation is fluffy looking, it doesn't really make you think of metastatic deposits uh, uh, you know, as a first instinct because some of them are more dense, some of them are more fluffy, and none of them are um, more than a centimeter. They're um, irregular looking, speculate looking, but not like the nodules you see in metastatic disease. And over time, these nodules cavitate and turn into cysts. And that's your uh, LCH. Uh, that's, I think, my last slide. I will pause here and ask you guys if you have any questions before we finish. Well, me nodules coalescing to form a patchy area of consolidation. It indicates benign etiology. It in indicates granulomatous inflammation. So sarcoidosis can look like that, TB can look like that. Uh, rarely, even um, unfortunately, metastatic disease can look like that. But the word coalescing nodules is used for TB and sarcoidosis. Is reticulation same as interlobular lobular septal thickening? The process is the same. Reticulation just means lines perpendicular along the pleural surface. But the, yeah, the, it's the same um, pathology that, that, is you, that looks like that. GLILD is, uh, is a new group of ILD that's seen in patients who have combined immunodeficiency syndrome. So patients, um, I don't know if you guys, it was a very famous movie, I've forgotten the name, you know, kids who have very skid, so severe immunocompromised uh, um, immunodeficiency that almost they call bubble babies. So they have to stay inside and always be protected and they have um, all sorts of immunodeficiencies, you know, IgG cells and all that. Lymphocyte, lymphocytic, neutropenic, all that. So they, this is the ILD that is associated with those patients. Um, it is very, very rare. It looks like a bronchocentric, nodular-looking, basal-predominant. Um, it looks like atypical infection. So these patients keep getting worked up for mycobacterium infection. Um, so the airway is inflamed, and that is actually an ILD, and that is GLILD. Does no smoke history of smoking exclude LCH? No history of smoking excludes LCH in male or female. Okay, feedback link, please.